Welcome back. My name is Dr. Stephen Sennett. I'm an osteopathic American uh, physician. And I'm going to continue now with part two of cranial theory or osteopathy in the cranial field. We've looked at the osseous model. Now let's look at the pressure stat model. Dr. Upperledger, he proposed that the cranial rhythm that we were palpating was fluctuating due to changes, pressure, uh, pressure changes within the, cra uh, the cranium due to uh, creation and reabsorption of cerebral spinal fluid. He felt that it was a closed hydraulic uh, system. Welcome back. My name is Dr. Stephen Sennett. I'm an American osteopathic physician. I'm continuing now with part two of basic cranial theory. In the first part, we looked at the osseous model. Now let's look at John Upledger's pressure stat model. Uh, John felt that the reason why we were palpating cranial rhythm was because of pressures that were changing within the cranium as a result of cerebral spinal fluid uh, being created and then being reabsorbed. He considered this to be a closed hydraulic uh, mechanism. The cerebral spinal fluid doesn't flow in the same way that um, arteries and veins go from point A to point B. It's more like a bath that has a general direction. So CSF here is bathing the brain and spinal cord. It is made in the ventricles. Um, it's made by ependymal cells in the choroid plexus of the various ventricles. The reabsorption of this is happening. 50% uh, of it we can account for in the arachnoid, granulation, arachnoid granulations in the superior sagittal sinus. This is one of the um, defects in this model is that this cannot be a closed hydraulic system because if you will, the system we can consider it to be semi-closed because while we have only 50% absorbed here, um, let's talk about what might be happening to other parts of the, uh, where the rest of the cerebral spinal fluid may be going. This is a representation showing of how CSF is distributed um, in the brain tissue, in arterial blood, it can be detected in venous blood. And this is in the CSF uh, that's bathing the brain and spinal cord. So a lot of it is being absorbed into the brain tissue. Uh, there are a minute, minute amounts that can be traced outside of the uh, brain in the uh, blood system. And some people will, I think, extend this theory to say this is why the pulse is propagated. Again, I'm not asking you to believe it or to not believe it, okay? I'm just telling you what is popular thought. So when people talk about palpating uh, fluid tides and such outside of the brain, that theory is propagated because we can trace CSF outside of the brain. The question becomes how much can we trace or is this perhaps an energetic palpation? Again, I'm just giving you common ideas that are out there in the osteopathic world. Uh, this is a volume of uh, the CSF as broken down within the, the brain and spinal cord. So this is in the subarachnoid space. This is where most of it ends up, the subarachnoid space. The spinal subarachnoid space is the next big chunk here. This is what we'll find in lateral ventricles, third ventricle and fourth ventricle. Again, these are all kind of contributing uh, like faucets into a generalized bath that has a generalized direction that it goes in. It's not the same as going point A into point B as you would have in the vascular system. Some interesting developments. Um, uh, I think these, I would still call these recent even in 2020, because prior to this, they weren't sure that um, there was any lymphatics actually exiting the brain and that CSF was exiting the brain by some other channels. 
So this is an artery uh, of a mouse, and this was in the Journal of Translational Medicine in 2012. And they're clearly showing um, the lymphatic system allowing some drainage of cerebral spinal fluid. Another uh, recent article uh, is from Nature in 2015. Um, they did find some T-cell gateways in and out of the meninges where lymphatic vessels were, were discovered. Again, this is a recent discovery. So it's another pathway for lymphatic system and CSF uh, to exit the brain. And this helps to support that um, pressure stab model. Membranous model. Uh, Dr. Fulford was a big proponent of the membranous model. He said, this is where um, whatever is causing this palpation event that we feel in cranial rhythm, this is where it's happening, that it's happening in the dura. Uh, he also proposed that this could be an energetic force that propels the primary respiratory mechanism uh, into motion through the reciprocal tension membrane of the dura. So here we have the, uh, the um, dura motors in three layers. This is the pia mater. This we can't really discern with our eye because it's just a cell thick on top of the brain. So we can't really discern that. Then we have uh, a space and we have the, uh, the arachnoid mater. And then we have the dura mater, this uh, pink layer here. The dura mater here is very strong, very thick, very resilient. And this attaches to all the ridges that we looked at in the previous slides. So the ridges within the skull are attached here. And this is where uh, if a motion is happening, it's causing reciprocal motion in other areas of the, of the skull. Um, this is our idea here with, uh, with um, what is happening in the cranial motion. This is showing us flexion. During flexion, there is a um, shortening of the AP diameter of the skull by less than 500 microns and a widening laterally. So that actually, um, so that actually the brain is not getting, the, the uh, vault is not getting bigger or smaller that would cause abnormal pressures on the brain. Uh, what's actually happening is it's just changing formation, uh, changing its shape. This is an inside view here showing uh, the dura as it uh, bifurcates the tentorium cerebelli, as it bifurcates over the cerebellum, comes along the, the um, this is the petrous ridge, posterior clinic processes, anterior clinic processes, and that's gonna run up to Christigalli and over the superior sagittal sinus. I'm not making this a review of anatomy, really. Um, I'm not making this a review of anatomy, just giving you some brief structures. The dural attachments here, I've written all the, um, I've written it all out. Uh, so there's no need for really to memorize it. And again, what I want you to understand from this is that the dura is attaching wherever these ridges are. So it's attaching to all of the bones all over the inside of the vault so that if a motion happens on one, it causes a motion to happen on another one. Uh, these are the dural sinuses. Um, it is a bit confusing to look at this diagram. It looks like they are veins. The sinuses are really spaces that are created by gaps in the dural membrane. So that's what's significant to see here. Um, rather than thinking of this as a vein per se, the difference would be is that a vein has uh, a tunica intima, a tunica muscularis and an adventitia. The sinus is really a space created by two layers of dura coming together. So those are the attachments within the brain. These are attachments around the tentorium cerebelli. These are all just anatomy points. So I'm, I'm going to go a little faster over that discussion. I've just listed them for you. So if you come back to this video and want to freeze frame it to study it, um, that'll be an easy way to do it. And the venous sciences, as I said, give the appearances of their veins, but they are spaces. And since they are spaces and not veins, and they don't, they don't have the ability, um, not in the same way as a vein does for that type of contraction. They also lack valves. So that's why if you stand on your head for a period of time, uh, you'll start to feel a little strange because the blood does start to pool. 
This um, doesn't really belong with any of the theories. I just didn't have a place to comfortably put this slide. So I just put it here. Uh, and it's an interesting um, feature for cranial and that is Meckel's cave. Uh, Meckel's cave is where the dura is actually coming out along the, uh, the um, portion here of the trigeminal nerve and coming out towards the face. Um, it's it's um, very useful uh, in the cause cases of trigeminal neuralgia, Bell's palsy. These are things we might consider Meckel's cave for. So the dura is attaching within the skull. It also has attachments um, that are coming outside the skull. Um, Charlotte Weaver. Uh, we'll just mention one thing about Charlotte Weaver here. We have a whole other lecture uh, on, on what she has accomplished. But Charlotte Weaver was working independently, not with Dr. Sutherland. She had her own ideas. Uh, her idea centered around the idea that the dorsum cellae was causing emotion, was causing emotion that affected the pituitary gland and the hypothesis. Um, so she didn't acknowledge um, a primary respiratory mechanism, but she did stress cranial mobility, that there was a motion that needed to happen in the skull for proper uh, maintenance of your endocrine system and other cranial structures. The dura is a reciprocal tension membrane. This is the basic model from osteopathy in the cranial field. This is a sagittal view showing our theorized motions, what happens between the bones which I will give you in a separate uh, lecture. Uh, this is showing what happens during flexion, that because the dura attaches to all of the bones, it attaches to the cervical spine, to the skull, to the entire spine through dentate ligaments, sacrum and coccyx. This is where the term craniosacral manipulation is coming from. Because it attaches to all these bones, a motion in one causes motions in the other bones. And that this is how the crania craniosacral rhythm or the, as Dr. Sutherland did not use that term, he used the primary respiratory mechanism. This is how that was propagated. Oh, there's another feature called the Sutherland fulcrum. Uh, the Sutherland fulcrum is where we believe the tension is balancing and that area is in the straight sinus. This is the straight sinus here. This is not proved in any sort of laboratory. This is a theoretical, um, theoretical component of cranial osteopathy, that if the skull is just changing shape and not actually becoming bigger or smaller, if it's just deforming, then there must be a balance point within that dural membrane. And that balance point is said to shift along this fulcrum. The idea of a shifting fulcrum would be, uh, I just drew this example here, is there a way that these guys, these two blocks can be here in a balanced way? Well, there is if the fulcrum shifts. So as tensions are shifting, if we had changing orange blocks up here, this fulcrum is moving along. That's the idea. And it's moving along this straight sinus. Um, the last slide is, um, and I'll just say one slide here. I will give uh, other much longer involved specific lectures on biodynamic model, but just to say one model here, what Dr. Sutherland felt was happening uh, when he later on was introduced to Dr. Blechschmidt, Drs. Blechschmidt and Gasser, was that the reason why cranial rhythm was happening, he changed his mind that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a bony impetus that was causing it to happen, it was an embryologic impetus. So if we go back to the idea of the primitive streak on about day 15, on day 15, the epiblast here had had no orientation. We don't know where the top was. We don't know where the bottom was. Then you had this primitive streak that now gave us a top and a bottom. Later on, cells will migrate uh, to the sides. We now have a two-dimensional, if you will, a two-dimensional embryo. There's a left and a right. We don't know which is left and right until there's a folding here, okay? Uh, until there's a folding. And when that folding occurs, then we have a three-dimensional organism. The biodynamic model says that the impetus for flexion is what's happening here at the primitive streak. Okay, that this, this energy causing this primitive streak is what has caused our first flexion. And then there's a very specific details about how this manifests in the body with flexion and extension. 
again, I will go into that further in subsequent lectures. I'm going to end here with basic cranial theory. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe to our channel and let your colleagues be aware that we're going to be continually posting more and more osteopathic information. Thank you for your attendance.